Ah, good afternoon. I was going to say good morning there. Whatever it is. Yeah, we're already off to a good start. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. This is our Between Two Bibles, or whenever, I guess whenever they're watching this, because later on it'll be posted sure, it could be later. Morning. So morning, evening, afternoon, whatever the time of day is that God has appointed you to watch this. It's good to be with you as uh, we're continuing on with our discussion. Uh, today we're switching gears. Um, I thought, here's, you want to just give them the assignment for this week as we get ready? Okay, the assignment this week, our main bulk of the reading is Acts 4 through 19. We're going to go all the way back to Acts 1 and talk about that too today. But 4 through 19 is the readings, and then Psalms 10 through 12, and Matthew 13 through 16. Nice. So, back, we're into the New Testament for the first time. We finished right. our first book, now into the New Testament. And switching the gears, you know, it's kind of... Um... I mean, and we kind of already noted that in some of our discussions and, and our prep for this and everything is um, how much, you know, you see the book of Genesis Play already out. in Acts. Um, you know, cause, and it makes sense because this is all the promises that have been made to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now fulfilled in Christ. And of course, you know, so we're going to hear a lot more of that as we dig into the book of Acts today and just, you know, fascinating book. And it, it's kind of what I, you know, I've, I've said this too before. I wish the New Testament had more of the book of Acts. I wish we had like Acts 2 and Second Acts or, you know, something or other, you know, things that we could have as it's well. It's like in the Old Testament, you get so much of the history, whereas right. in the New Testament, you basically have Acts. Right. I mean, you get the Gospels, you get a bit of, you know, Jesus' ministry, but Acts is the only history book, really. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's the only one that really gives us an idea of what's going on. Yep. So, yeah, anything that is, you know, as we dug into the book of Acts that kind of connected with you, especially as we just got down to Genesis, anything that stuck out as we read? Um, well, the big thing for me is that, you know, you had the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your offspring will bless all the nations. And in Acts, right. we see the blessing all the nations because, well, for one, the disciples and Paul are going out to all these, you know, different areas but it's also the gentiles are brought into the faith so no it's no longer just the jews it really is all nations are being welcomed into the church yeah um so that's a major fulfilling of that um prophecy is what's happening in acts right and and we're going to see you know the book of acts is it, if there's any i guess way to describe like what's happened in the book of acts is a it's a transition um where you have at the beginning of the book, it really focuses on Jerusalem and the temple, and at the end of the book, you're all the way in pagan Rome. Um, and you, you have it being a, the start of a Jewish movement, and then by the end of the book, you get more Gentiles. In fact, at the end of the book, there's kind of the, the Paul's kind of, well, fine, since you guys are not going to go and believe in Jesus as your Messiah, I'm going to go next door to the Gentiles, and that's how the book ends, um, you know, with him proclaiming Christ to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, this transition you know, of leadership, and we even have the beginning of the book, it starts in Peter and then it ends with Paul. Uh, so just kind of a, um, a, a movement, it's almost, uh, and Lucas does a great job of pinpointing this, where actually the middle of the book is actually the fulcrum of everything is Acts chapter 15 with the Jerusalem Council. It's where everything switches um, and the emphasis in the book changes, um, which is kind of fun as well. You had a, or you had heard a theory on what, what, the book of Acts, what the initial purpose was with um, Paul. Yeah. Um, and this, I forget, there's another book I read this in, but uh, one of the popular scholars on this, Paul Meyer, he talked about this in his um, Flames of Rome book, and he kind of hints at this. We don't know for certain, you know, what this exactly is. We're told that the book of Acts and the book of Luke, because if you remember, um, we haven't read, we'll get to Luke on our own eventually, but the book of Luke begins by Luke saying, Oh, Theophilus, you know, and He's writing this book to him, and then at the book, beginning of the book of Acts, we get Luke saying, hey, uh, Theophilus. In my um, first book. Everything. Yeah, everything <laughs> that I wrote in my first book that Jesus had begun to do and teach, here's what he continued to do. So the book of Acts is the work of Jesus through his church now, um, and what he's still teaching and doing. Uh, and so you kind of have, like, why is, who's, who's Theophilus? There's lots of debates on that. We don't know uh, the titles that Luke gives to him uh, at, at kind of assumes more maybe a regal, that he's a, an official, maybe a Roman magistrate, maybe in Rome. Um, so Luke could be addressing someone maybe in Caesar's household. We, we're not exactly sure. Um, but it's kind of cool to think that. But in that book, he kind of references maybe one of the reasons why Acts came into being uh, was because of Paul. Uh, because as you follow Paul in the back half of the book, Paul is going to trial on Rome. He's appealed to the Roman emperor uh, I'm going to have Nero hear my, my case, 
And so the back half of the book of Acts is just him going to Rome. And then you're expecting this huge trial in front of Nero, and you're waiting for it in the book of Acts, and then it, it just ends. ends. And you're like, what was that? I want Acts um, 3. Right. Or I, Acts 2, I right. guess. This I, third book. I want a third, third <laughs> compendium here. Right? What happened? Uh, and church tradition would tell us that Paul did, in fact, stand before Nero and give a witness and was released. Um, and, but, you know, this is, we don't have anything concrete written in the scriptures for us. So you kind of wonder, like, okay, what was the purpose of this? Why is it cut off? And, and one of the conjectures, one of the thoughts, pop, you know, fun theories, um, is that Luke wrote this as a character, a witness for Paul's trial. So Paul's going to go on trial before the emperor. And he's going to be like, who are you, Paul? What are you doing? What is going on? I've heard about this Christian movement. What is it about? And so this is kind of Luke's way of presenting the case before the emperor. Here's why we're on trial. Paul did everything right. In fact, this is why maybe Luke focuses on Paul's trials before mm-hmm. like Festus and Agrippa. Um, and his being a Roman citizen. Yes, yeah, so kind of playing into that. So it's kind of trying to vindicate Paul here. So Luke is trying to give a witness for Paul's trial. And, uh, you know, that's as good as a theory as any. Um, but it is kind of fun to think that, you know, this is maybe a reason why Luke wrote that. So I think why you said the stuff with, like, Peter and the other disciples at the beginning might have been added on after. Right. That it's like, oh, I have this account of the early Let's church. Add Let's more. go to the, you know, to that where it really, you know, it started before Paul came along. Right. I, mean, I guess Paul was there, he but he wasn't a Christian at the time, so. Which may explain the we parts, because Luke is also a character witness then in this trial. So he writes these we sections in there to say, I too was a witness to this. Uh, so it kind of adds to the credibility to it all as well. Uh, but we'll dig into all those fun discussions, yeah. too, as we, we dig into the book. But it's just so kind of fun A little bit of background see it all. of why Acts exists. Right. Um, and, and it really is about... And the book itself, right, the Acts, this is an ancient way of talking and writing. Uh, you know, we have a year-end report. At the end of the year, when we write it down, it's like, here's what everyone did, here's the, the stats and everything. Uh, that's what this book actually means. So, like, Pilate would wrote acts during his years as pro- procurator of so Judea. A, the official title is the Acts yeah. of the Apostles, I yep. believe. Acts of the Apostles. So we just shortened it to yeah. Acts. This is the concluding end year report of the Apostles. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of the implication maybe. That's kind of yeah. the style of the book. Um, which is why, you know, we talk about, and it is a history because it tells us here's what they did. Um, but this is why 25% of the book is actually speeches. Uh, so you get Paul, he's preaching all the time. You get Peter, he's preaching all the time. Because um, they're actually giving a witness to, here's what Jesus commanded us to do. He said to go proclaim his name um, and to spread his word and to bring more into the truth of the gospel, into the kingdom of God. And this is what the whole book of Acts then is detailing. And here's how they did it. And here's what they did to do it. Um, and we'll talk more about, you know, what is the content of their message and what's the, the speech there, which is fascinating stuff. But... Uh, anything else that you can kind of think of before we start digging the, the, the uh, topics that we need we to talk about? I think we have quite a bit to dig into, so maybe we should get going on okay. it. Okay. Well, baptism. Yes. So a few odd baptisms, right? If you, I don't know, maybe as you're reading the book of Acts, you'll see this. Um, there's a few few weird accounts of baptism. <laughs> there's and, the more normal yeah, ones where, right. like, I mean, uh, Pentecost, where you, uh, is it Peter who gives the speech at Pentecost? Yeah, yeah. Peter, and then, you know, what is it, 3,000 people are baptized? Um, 5,000. 3,000, I think, on the first day. 3,000, 5,000 another time, yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's like, you know, 3,000 are baptized. I mean, that's more the normal. You preach right. the word, people receive the word, they get baptized. Right. Um, but then you get some of the odd ones where you get um, where these people have the Holy Spirit and then they're baptized with water and then you get the reverse where they're baptized in the name of Jesus but they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Um, right. And then you have the baptism of John which is still floating around there. Yeah. Um, so I don't know which one of those you want to talk about first. Maybe one order. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. So you get this movement and this is probably a fun thing to talk about too. As the, because this is right after Saul's persecution of the church um, and the church has now been scattered abroad which that will be another fun point to bring out here soon too. Um, is kind of how the movement of Christ works. You know, he told them at the beginning, you're going to start in Jerusalem, you can go to Samaria, Judea, and you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly how Acts details things. Um, so you, you get those checkpoints along the way. So uh, they're in Jerusalem at the beginning. And then here in 8, they're in Samaria. They're like, oh, you're like, oh, Jesus said that's where they're going to go. And then they're going to go to the rest of Judea and Galilee, those all those areas. And finally, at the end of the book, 
they're in Rome. So they now they Rome reached, is the center of the world at that right. point. Yes, yeah, as far you know, there's nothing else besides Rome, right? Nothing exists outside the of Rome. The Roman Empire was rather large at that point. Yeah. So <laughs> for them, this is the ends of the world, right? This is where they're at. Um, and so that, but here in Acts eight, we get this, um, you know, pause. They're in Samaria, and they're preaching to the Samaritans, right? The, the half Jews, the the oh, the contemptible Samaritans. Uh, and here we're told that um, they believe. Where is it? It's um, verse fourteen, chapter eight, verse fourteen, right? Uh, now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And, you know, that's one of those received, causes for Paul. Well, yeah. they received the Pause. word of God. The word of God is Jesus. So I suppose that does make sense. They received Jesus. Right. But they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Right. Which is one of those points like, well, why not? Because, you know, yeah. especially, and this will always be used by, you know, like non-denominationals or your, your more fundamentalist groups and things like that as you a case be, for... They separate baptism. out the water baptism yep. and baptism with you know, the See, Holy there's Spirit. two baptisms here, right? And it's like, mm, um, And that's a good, you know, a good thing. We talked about prescriptive stuff a couple weeks yeah. ago. Like, here are the things that God prescribes in the Bible. And then there's other things that are descriptive. And you get here, this is a descriptive moment. It's not something where we say, oh, see, this is how it happened. This is how it should be doing um, here. But this kind of even talk about emphasizing the point of baptism, right? The exception proves the rule here. Um, because who do they send down to them? Did you catch that in the text there? Like, the, the, the apostles. It was yeah. the main people. Peter and John, right? So the people who baptized and preached the Samaritans, they were the lay. They, they were non, you know, they were not the apostles, and so here the text in chapter 8 is trying to make a connection with the very fact that the church is apostolic. It's trying to make a very important point, a very important point <laughs> that, uh, if I can say that correctly. Say it five times fast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, a very important point <laughs> that uh, to, in order to be a part of the church, it must be apostolic. Uh, and so it's not trying to say that what they had received was not the full thing or less than, but the text is trying to say that these apostles are the ones who are carrying the mission forward. And even still today, for the, we confess it in the creed, right? We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church um, that we derive our source and our context from the apostles. We're teaching what they teach, and our, it's from that. So here the text is trying to make it clear that the Holy Spirit comes through their hands, right? The, the proclamation of the word is from them, even though it can be done later, and we'll find it with later, right in the very next section with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. There's a very next story after this. Uh, what does Philip do? He's technically not one of the apostles, and he baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. So now we see in the text, it almost kind of corrects, it, it kind of, it'll see, okay, it's still good, uh, but it's trying to so highlight kinda, the apostles. It's kind of saying... Anyone technically can, like, if I were to come across the scene of an accident, someone's dying, and right. they're like, I want to be baptized, I can baptize them. Yeah. But it's important that it's also tied to a church. So yeah. I would come here and tell you as the, you know, you're the minister, the pastor, you're kind of the successors almost of the right. apostolic ministry is the pastoral ministry. They're, you know, so I would tell you, and it would be official be right. part of the church and, and be recorded in our roles. That person would be rolled as a member, even though they've already been, you know, they're dead already, um, and they're a member of the church, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an official act. So it's just kind of saying that this isn't, and this is also it should be done orderly. Orderly, yeah, right? God's a God of order, and that this is a way that the Holy Spirit's trying to, you know, God is telling us um, the focus and the purpose of these things, and yeah, that kind of how organized it is. You know, we, the early church is always kind of like, oh, they're just doing things. They had no idea what they're doing. Um, but yet we see here that they're very organized, right? The, the church hears about this. We got to send people. Peter and John. Uh, P uh, Peter and J John, go check it out. And they do. Um, so yeah, so when you really get to that first point, I think too much is made on that. And I think a lot of the evangelical mindset, especially the, you know, your baptism, the other thoughts about baptism here, they really throw in a lot of their um, theology instead of just looking at the text and saying, hey, instead this is of taking reinforcing the clear the passages, word. like the clearest passage on um, baptism is probably Acts 2, where what is, where is that? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will see the, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So right there, clear statement of what yep. you repent, baptism, 
for your forgiveness, you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's probably the clearest statement of baptism. And so obviously this is, like you said, an exception yep. that proves the rule, kind yep. of. And really, and, and when you see those weird things in Scripture, it's supposed to cue you in and thinking, why is that weird? Why, why is that different? Why is that outside the norm? And I think especially for this first one, it's telling us, it's trying to make us focus on the importance of the apostles. Well, and if you um, continue it comes through them. into this passage, too, you get into Simon the Magician, who... Yep. Um, he wants to buy the gift. Yeah. Yep. Simon. -y. So he, it kind of connects with that, where it's, it's not like this magical thing thing right. even with the apostles that the, their hands that are laying it on that this magical thing it's it's right. god's word it's it's the ministry not the people um, yep. so it yeah kind of all connects there so yeah so i think when you look at that first one if you stop and pause and you look especially in the context there so you connect it with simon the magician there and you connect it with philip the ethiopian in the next section there who's not one of the apostles it's really cueing us into the fact that this faith is apostolic and you can't you can't sideline that. It, it's it must derive from them. Um, so again, it might be important too to say that the headers and the chapters in your Bible are not original, right. and so all these stories aren't meant to be taken separately. I mean, they're put right. in a certain order for a certain reason. They they build off each other, right? So the the chapters, the verses, the those little section headers, right? They're not inspired text. Yeah. They're helpful, but they're not inspired, and so you shouldn't take them as oh, okay. This is a separate section. This is a separate yep. section. This is a separate section. There's maybe individual stories, but they, they're in there in that order and emphasized yep. for reason. And um, that's why it's good actually to read the Bible in larger chunks because yep. we get it in church where you get the short sections yeah. and you focus in the and that's good too. Yep. But it's also good to read them in larger chunks because you start picking up on how these stories are connected and where they are in yep. the Bible. And that's, and that's key when you read, especially the Gospels, right? You see it all the time. Like these stories are put together for a reason. And, and yeah. you see it, especially when you, you study Greek or Hebrew, yeah. you see actually the, the structure being well, it's formed. A, isn't it it's fun. Mark that's big on that where it'll be like, he'll have one story and then a story sandwich in between and then it'll almost go back yeah. to that first story. So it's like you have this sandwich and those all connect together yep. and they usually play off of each other and you can learn something by reading it all together. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, here we're dovetailing, but this is still, this is an important point when you're reading the scriptures, how you read them. Um, because there's a purpose, there's an argument being built and there's, these stories are kind of pointing us to, oh, okay. Uh, so you have that in Mark where, you know, he comes into Jerusalem, he, um, sees the fig tree, curses the fig tree, he does his thing in the temple, right? He, he overturns the tables and, and then the next day, the next story is the, the fig tree withered. And they, so you're like, okay, why is, uh, you get the fig tree, temple, fig tree. And what's trying to make us point to is the temple. And so what does Jesus do in the temple? He condemns it. Uh, he says, this is dumb. He's, it's, it's all over. And that's why the, the result is the withered fig tree. Well, and so it's trying to point to us to that. Ezekiel. I keep forgetting yeah, yeah. this. Ezekiel yeah. is where. Because in there you get the withered fig tree along with the same, the prophecy about the, the what right. Jesus quotes. And so you get that connection back to that too. Right. But, yeah. And, and you get as fun too in Mark. Uh, Dr. Vells, you fantastic he studied the book of mark for 50 years of his life and he notes that in that section in fact too there's a back forth back forth a step stone and he says that that's actually a very key moment in the gospel of mark that is telling us the kind of the whole structure of the book and it's just kind of you know we could talk about that yeah. for an hour but that's important stuff for reading so structure is important um okay. both in the church and in our writing should we get on to the next chapter 10 Let's do baptism it. All right. Holy Spirit first. Right. So here's a fun one. So yeah, you get to chapter 10 and remind me here, it's the Gentiles at the very end. Yeah, because um, first Peter gets his vision about the, um, uh, the eat, what is it? He's hungry, wants something to yep. eat. And then um, the voice from heaven says, you know, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And he's like, but this is unclean. And um, don't call something that's. Um, God has made clean, unclean, and so this yeah. is leading into the Gentiles, because the Gentiles are unclean. Um, so right. you get there, and then you get the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. Yeah, and that really picks up, and I think that's key, what you just said, right? Don't call unclean what I have made clean. And how are these people made clean? By faith, right? They hear the word and they believe it. And boom, as, as Peter's saying these things, we're told that the Gentiles are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says um, there in verse 47, uh, 10, chapter 10, verse 47, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then that's another right. People say, oh, see, there's a Holy Spirit baptism and there's a water baptism. 
Uh, these are separate. And this is not trying to separate the two here, but it's once again trying to make an important distinction because who are these people that Peter is preaching to? They're not Jews. Yeah. <laughs> this is the this has never happened before. This is something that's completely foreign. This is something, you know, you get snippets of in the Old Testament here and there, but nothing like this. Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon non-Israelite people, um, and they are now of the same, you know, they are believing of the same faith, and it's this moment in the text, this is chapter 10, is so crucial, um, because it changes everything. God has now sent the church to the Gentiles, and that's the result of here, too. In chapter 11, the Jews say, why did you eat with those people? Why did you stay with those people? And then Peter retells the whole story. And then at the end of it, these, the Jews find out, when they had heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Which is fun, right? Because we usually think of repentance as something we do. But here we're told in the text that repentance is granted to them. Uh, so God is the one that has to enact repentance, which is, you know, let's talk about something that's mind-blowing. Um, you know, we don't usually don't think of repentance that way, but God is the one that enables repentance. We think it's, um, yeah, it usually turns into the first act you have to do to right. come to faith. It's the decision theology kind yep. of idea. Um, yeah, but, you know, and that, that lends us back into the importance of what happens here with the Holy Spirit falling in the Gentiles. So it's here is not trying to say that, you know, baptism doesn't give the Holy Spirit or that, you know, th there are two separate events here. It's the same event happening, but it's just trying to make a point that the Holy Spirit is being poured out on Gentiles. That's the, that's the key focus. It should make us stop and go, this is weird because it's getting, give, the Holy Spirit's now been given to the Gentiles. Not that maybe, it's saying something about baptism. Again, it maybe emphasizes that baptism isn't like this magical spell that if you do it right, the Holy Spirit comes. You know, also kind of, true. Like you say these words, the Holy Spirit comes. It's God's action. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, that happens with the you know, Ethiopian eunuch and things like that. Because people will say, well, see, I don't need to be baptized. I just have faith in Jesus. And it's like, okay, good. But what does your faith want? Your faith wants what, what God Jesus... Gives. Yeah. Um, and so if someone, you know, if someone turns down that gift, so be like the Ethiopian eunuch at the end, he believes, right? He has faith in the Holy Spirit. And then his next words were, why should I not be baptized, right? What prevents me from this? And he gets back. It would be a different story if he's like, well, I don't need baptism because I already have faith. I would be looking and say, no, you don't, because uh, you don't want what God gives there. Well, it's um, a, you know, back to what Peter said about baptism. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. It's yep. you, you're given forgiveness of sins in baptism, so if you believe you want forgiveness of sins, and that's how it's given. Yep. Or one of the ways it's given, I guess. Yeah. Um, so if you don't want, why would you not want all the possible avenues that God has given for our forgiveness? Right. Um, and it, once again, you know, we talk about baptism as we as Lutherans, right? The baptism is this concrete physical act that I can look back and say that, right? This is, how do, how do I know Jesus still loves me? Well, he baptized me. He wouldn't make that mistake, right? He's taking care of that. Um, you know, it's the importance of the Lord's Supper. You get into that, right? It's this God's continual assurance. It's just that pure gospel. Um, and, and that should, and they should never be divorced from each other. That's always kind of the, 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 the concern here, and this is what they'll do, right? There's, there's two different baptisms. And go read Ephesians. There is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, right? There's not two different kinds of baptisms. Um, you know, even here, it's, it's connecting to the same event. We'll, we can't withhold water from them now. Yeah. You know, put it on. Um, and if they've been, yeah, and then, but the other one was they've been baptized with water, so they should get, you know, right. receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I think I said earlier, it's kind of like where some people come to faith through the word and then get baptized and then you get like infants who are baptized and then are you know grow yeah. in the word um so you know someone gains faith through the holy spirit so if they have faith before they're baptized they have the holy spirit right um so it's just it's like right. multiple ways of coming to faith basically yeah and then god continues to grow that faith and, and nourish it right and the church then is to also instruct and teach so that faith is nourished um, you know, baptism is usually called a seal, right? In the ancient world, a seal, you know, we, we're in Wisconsin, we stamp our cows, right? You tag them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what baptism is. God tagging, saying, that's my, that's my cow. That's my person. Mm -hmm. That's my child. Um, so it's his, God's way of saying that you now belong to me. Um, so yeah, baptism is that seal. So good. Well, there's one more. 18, um, chapter, chapter 18. 18. And, and that's uh, where... What happens there? 
Uh, I forget who it was, but they talked about Polis. the fact Apollos. There we go. End of chapter 18 there. I'm on the wrong page. That's my problem. Um, yeah, he he's um, he only knows the baptism of John. Right. So basically he's, um, what does it say? He's came from Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. So he knows the scriptures. He knows about Jesus, but he only knows the baptism of John. Yep. So that's what he's been baptizing people into. Yep. He's been baptizing them into an, an old covenant. One, uh, no one but John had been given the right to do that baptism. So this is not Apollos' baptism. Uh, so one that tells us already that who does he think he is? He's giving John's baptism because that, that's over. Only God only told John to do this, not Apollos. Uh, so he's kind of like wrongly taking upon himself that which he cannot do. Because we, up until this point, this is the first time we meet Apollos, and it seems like he's almost been self-educated. He's kind of been his own. He's almost like a lone ranger kind of thing. Yeah. And he's been doing his own thing, going through the churches, and then they meet him there in Ephesus. He's we're told right at the end of eighteen, yep. he's an eloquent uh, man, um, competent in the scripture, so he knows it. Uh, some people think. One of the people they think wrote the book of Hebrews is Apollos. Um, and you read the book of Hebrews, it's very well written. It's some of the best written stuff in the New Testament. Um, and so he's well versed in the scriptures. He's been instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, he's been fervent in spirit. Right? So he's spoken taught accurately. So it's not like he's, um, you know, it's not like, bad guy, evil against the faith. It's not but, like heretical or anything like right. that. He's You'd probably just, say more like heterodox in yeah. a good way, right? He's, he's strained he's from not quite, that. He's not quite right on the path, but he's close. <laughs> right. He's not far and from so, the kingdom of God. Priscilla and Aquila, who I believe are the ones that were tent makers, weren't yeah, they? With, with Paul. Paul and yep. Corinth. Um, they find him and take him aside, explain proper baptism, and Apollos is um, he's happy about that. And, yeah. And... Um, yeah. And that causes a problem, though, because up until this point, Apollos has been going to different churches. And on the way, he's been giving this baptism. And so now, this is why in chapter 19, Paul has to go, okay, well, we got to go where Apollos just was. We got, you know, backtrack here and kind of cover the ground again. And so Paul tells us, Apollos, he went on to Corinth, which will set up the book of First Corinthians here, because Apollos goes there. Uh, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. So he's going back and and he asked them, he finds some disciples and says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Because all of a sudden, you know, they have a problem. Uh, Apollos has been doing the wrong baptism. He's not been applying the right techniques or method. Um, and then he, he says, into what baptism? We never, we hadn't heard this about Holy Spirit. Who's that? Um, and and who, what, what baptism were you baptized with? And they say, well, John's. And it's like, ah, here's where Apollos was. Um, and so here we got, and this sets up an interesting question. You know, we talk about, um, certain instances where you would need to rebaptize them. Um, here, Paul just lays his hands on them. But, you know, in our context, if we had a Jehovah's Witness or, um, you know, Mormon or something like that, they're not baptized into the name, they're not given a Christian baptism. Um, they're baptized into a different understanding of who God is, right? For them, like a Mormon, there's three gods, you know, and so not one God. And so when they're baptized, they're baptized into a, you know, tri -God, a tritheism here. Um, that's not Christian baptism. And so in that case, we would actually look at that person and say, you need to be Probably. not rebaptized. You need to be baptized because you weren't baptized, um, not into the Christian yeah. faith. Well, and because the idea of baptism, I think we sometimes get that screwed up, that baptism is strictly a Christian thing, but like baptism right. just means to wash. Right. I mean, like you said, the Jews baptized their couches and their yeah. cups and stuff. <laughs> I mean, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was... Yeah. It was preparing people to receive Jesus, basically. Right. Um, and so baptism isn't you. So you have to have a Christian baptism. And yeah. Baptism isn't just sprinkling someone with water and saying anything. Right. Um, Christian baptism has to have God's word. Yep. It has to be in His institution, right? That's yeah. a that's the one thing you go to for the the validity of baptism comes from God's institution, His word. Um, and so that's, you know, that goes into here. But in the text, that kind of emphasizes here, they re didn't receive baptism. They didn't receive that Holy Spirit. So Paul kind of has to kind of finish it. He says, all right, and he has to lay his hands on them, and they're given the Holy Spirit. And it's a visible. It's kind of a public. It's kind of like, and it's given in a very uh, visible way, which they start speaking in other languages and prophesying. Um, and there are 12 men in all. So we're, we're told here this little small knit church. Um, is completed in their catechesis, if, a, if you can put it that way. Um, so yeah, so each of these three encounters that you can cover with baptism is not saying like, well, see, this is really what baptism is about, but it's highlighting something weird. One, there needs to be, back in chapter 8, 
there needs to be apostolic witness to it. Um, chapter 10, it's highlighting the fact that Gentiles are now, so it's not just something for the Jews, but it's also something for all people. And then in chapter 18, it's highlighting the fact that the validity needs to come from the ordinance, from the institution that God has established for it. Uh, so, which once again just highlights the very institution of baptism. And we look at Luther's small catechism and things like that. That's the same exact questions that Luther goes into. What is baptism? It's God's word in and with the water, right? What gives baptism validity? The word of God. What gives baptism its benefit? Faith, right? Because you need to have faith to receive the benefits that God gives there. Um, and so, you know, you can, get in, you can get into all these things too. So those three texts, it's always weird when you read them like, oh man. But you kind of almost have to take it as a whole again. You do. Um, that's why you start picking random things, that's where you get weird ideas of, yep. and not just baptism, but anything. When you start nitpicking little verses, you have to take scripture as a whole. You have right. to take the book of Acts as a whole. Um, you can't just be like, point to that one example and be like, see, yep. you have to look Aha. at everything gotcha. the Bible says about baptism to understand baptism. Yep. And that, you know, sometimes in the book of Acts, like you'll have that with Peter's speech, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? And you'll have that. Well, this becomes a... Uh, um, we say the same thing. The White House issued a press. Uh, it's not the White House. It was the president and the staff and everything like that. Um, here, when he says the baptism of Jesus, it's shorthand for go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So it's just shorthand. Um, and a lot of people will try to make that. Like, so usually, because I ran into a church in St. Louis that said that we only baptize in the name of Jesus. And then I was like, well, what would you do with Matthew chapter 28? Like, well, that just wasn't part of the text. I'm like, well, that's convenient. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you well, got to deal with Jesus that. Jesus is kind of shorthand for God. Right. right? And, and God is shorthand for Father, Son, Spirit. We don't necessarily have to say that every single... We say it in baptism, but we right. don't have to reference it every single time we're talking about God or right. Jesus. Or and, and that's, and that's it's implied. What, right. And that's why we have to be careful while we're talking, too. Because when we say things like God, what do we mean by that? Because yeah. we take that, you know, in our context, you know, I can say to you and I can just say God. And you can say, yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But if you look out like a general person out there, or an atheist or a nominal Christian, you could you say, God, who knows what's going on in their head? Because that's shorthand. I heard a story of a, a Christian speaker who was speaking, I believe it was Japan, and so he had an interpreter. Mm. And um, mm. when he was talking to the interpreter beforehand or whatever, he was like, whenever you say God, I'm going to have to kind of explain. Because to them, God, you know, like they have ancestral gods and all right. that sort of thing. And so he had to emphasize, I think he had to say something about like creator God, or it was something, he had to like flesh out what he meant okay, by the yeah. word God when he was in, as he was interpreting what the speaker was saying. Because right. otherwise they would totally misinterpret it. Which the Bible does that all the time too. Paul's letters always will begin that way. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know who God is, the most proper way to say him is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, if you want to get the most accurate way of saying that's God, that, that's the God we're talking about, you, that's how you would say it. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so you, you talk that way, uh, you know, you, do, you have this all the time in the letters too, they sh they're shorthand. Um, and when you discuss it, then you gotta be clear of what that shorthand mm -hmm. means. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Good. We probably should move on. We should. We but, have other topics. Yeah, we do, but it's <laughs> always good stuff. Um, maybe after we're done with the Read the Bible of the Year, we'll have to start talking about some specific topics and continue right. this, but, yeah, it's fun. um, Next thing actually kind of goes a little bit well with the last one we were talking about with the speaking in tongues. There's a lot of miracles still happening in Acts. There's the speaking in tongues. There's the healings. Right. Why don't we see some of that now? Right. <laughs> um, I, and it's for several reasons. Uh, you get into who are the people that are going out, the apostles. And already, what did Christ give them to do, right? Heal. He had, he had sent them out uh, to heal and cast out demons. Right. So they can do this, right? So they, it's in their prerogative to do that. Um, it's not in their prerogative to give that gift, though. Only God can give that gift. So in terms of healing, um, this is not something that the apostles can pass on. They can't say, all right, I can, now you can, right? They, they don't do that. Whenever you see Paul or Peter commissioning or sending people, it's not go heal, it's go preach the word. Um, so they pass on the apostolic teaching and the word and the faith, but they can't pass on the things that only God himself can give. Uh, and, so it kind of goes institute. back to the apostolic witness. This right. is kind of... It's like how the prophets often did miracles and such. Yeah. It's kind of a saying, okay, this is legitimate. This is the early Christian church. Otherwise, people yeah. maybe wouldn't have believed them because, okay, Jesus has authority, but who are these people? Right. Um, so. Yeah, and, you know, you, you get that with also these healings that kind of go through. You look back at Jesus. Why does he heal? Because sometimes I think people take the healings as, 
I need to be healed now. If I'm not, then there's no God and blah, 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 blah. And 99% of the time it doesn't happen. And then, you know, so often they forsake the faith because their faith is built on the wrong image, the wrong, they have a different idol. Well, um, it kind of leads yeah. back to like the feeding of the 5,000 where people were following Jesus because, well, are you following me? Why are you following me? It's because you were, your bellies right. are filled. Right. Um, yeah. And so these healings, why does Jesus do them? Well, because Jesus is here, whenever, wherever Jesus is, there's almost the new Eden, the new creation is there. And so what comes with the new creation? Healed bodies, restored bodies. And so... Brought back to life bodies. Right. <laughs> um, and so you get this in the book of Acts as a way of giving the apostles validity, right? That they are true inheritors of this. And you kind of get this you, uh, later on with, with Timothy. You get this later on in Paul's letters too, um, that this gift is something that, Helps out at the beginning because it helps, like, oh, okay. Legitimate. Makes it legitimate. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I can't think of the word. (laughs) How to say it the other way. Yeah, Um, tongue twisters. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by tongue twisters. Um, But yeah, we'll get to that here in a minute. But um, it, but really, healings are always pointed to Christ and the new Eden, and it's a foreshadow. So whenever uh, healings happen, it is a foreshadow to the final healing that will happen to all. So one day, I, you and I won't need glasses. That'll be nice. It will be nice, <laughs> right? So that's a, a ahead of time blessing. But it doesn't come just yet, not to all. Um, it will happen to all, but not yet. Um, but there's also another you know, key point to pick up on this is that if you have these miracles happening all the time too, and, and it starts, this becomes the reason why, as we kind of noted already. Um, once the church is established, once that word is planted, and once it's firmly in place, you almost don't need those miracles anymore. You don't. and Because what are we? We're people of the word. And say, the word only. Otherwise, it's almost like people would come because, oh, I'm being healed. It's not yep. they don't really believe in God or, you know, they don't yeah. care about the word. They care about, oh, my body was healed instead yep. of thinking, looking to the future when everything will be restored. It's the very, it's right. very here in the moment kind of thinking and that's not and really what healed, the church is. Yep. And, and notice, too, what that kind of does with um, spirituality, um, with, with faith as, as well. Um, it, can, it makes healing the primary thing, but it neglects God's word, and it makes uh, God showy. Uh, God like isn't here false, to be showy. There's a lot of false preachers who do that. Like They emphasize the there's a faith healer type people, right. and it's just right. they're false prophets. I mean, they don't actually preach God's word. It's like... Oh well, if you had enough faith, you'd be healed now. Kind right of thing, and it's like that's not that's what not the it. promise is. No the promise is that if you have faith, which is given to you, then someday you you know you will be part of the new creation. Right, and, and which we already are partakers of right now. Right, yeah. so we live the way that we do in this world because we are a new creation in Christ, and uh, we just this don't day have is all the benefits be. yet. Right. Yeah, and that's Paul talking about. It's like the down payment. Yeah, and Paul says that in Ephesians. He says that, I think, in Corinthians, right? The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our salvation. So we have the Holy Spirit now as kind of God's down payment saying, the rest is coming. Don't worry. Here's something to hold you down in the meantime. Uh, So faith is what makes us right now part of the new creation. Uh, We have it by faith, but not by sight. Um, But this also makes us lean on the word only, right? Um, Once the church is firmly established, it doesn't need miracles. can, Can they happen? Sure. Uh, God is not restricted by that, but we're not to look to them. We're to look only to the word. Um, my power is made perfect, not in healings, but in weakness. Um, Paul, I want to know nothing else besides Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, right, so this, this eliminates loftiness, this eliminates wisdom, this eliminates healings, right? Jews seek signs, right? But the only thing that's given to us is Christ crucified. And so once these things are firmly in place, God kind of removes that and says, okay, you had this, now all you have is the word. And that's all the church has. That's all that we need. Um, you do see that still from time to time. There are reports, uh, you know, I can never substantiate any of that. But you always hear these reports that missionaries on the front will have cases healings happen. Or someone who's very against the church when it's first game planted. I've heard stories where missionaries, they're saying something, they tell them to be quiet, and the person becomes mute and they can't speak anymore. I, you hear stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then after a while, once the church is in place, these things kind of fade and they go away. Um, can God grant these things? Like I said, sure. Are we to look for them? No. Uh, will it come again the last day? You bet. Um, so it kind of helps us focus on these things. And I think the big key part in thinking about the healings, especially New Testament, the apostles, is it gives them legitimacy. Um, once again, that apostolic witness is key. 
And so Jesus is kind of throwing all the stops out, saying, yep, these are my guys. Uh, this is my church. It's um, the proof that they have God behind them, basically. Yeah, what they're saying them. is true. And then what's only the only thing to have back in them is the word, right? It's trust in the word, which is what all Adam and Eve had. So there's some, some verse in the Old Testament about a prophet and how they've given, mir- you know, they're able to do miracles as a sign kind of thing, or I don't know what I'm thinking of. If you remember, let me know. So, <laughs> anyway, um, you want to... You're talking like Isaiah 7, uh, ask for a sign kind of thing? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not topic. sure what I'm thinking of. I'll probably come across it in our readings at some point and then remember good. this. Um, briefly, speaking in tongues, it's not what most people think it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because this happens a few times in here and people, you know, you get the Pentecostals who think speaking in tongues or speaking in, kind you know, show. this language no one understands. Right. The tongues of angels are they're basically, right. there's a great Lutheran satire video there on that is. actually. Um, well, once again, right, they're trying to prove that I have faith. So they're trying to do something, you know, they're working. Yeah. Um, once again, you know, they, they'll say all day that it's not by our works that we're saved, but yet they always will turn to that for certainty because you've got to look for certainty somewhere. Um, and if you're not going to do it in God's works, you're going to do it in your own. So when um, you get speaking in tongues in like, at like Pentecost or here in... It's just different um, languages. Nine, eight, chapter 18, 19, wherever that is. 19. Right. Um, yeah, speaking in tongues, the word's glossa there. Actual languages. Yeah, and yeah, real languages <laughs> that people know what they so mean. So like at Pentecost, it's people were like, oh, I can understand this in my own language. And so yep. it's given to share the gospel to all nations right. again. That's um, where, where you get the word glossary, actually. Yeah. Tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, it's glossary. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, it's just, yeah, it's a language that people can understand, and it's that reversal of Babel, right? We just read that in the book of Genesis. God scatters the, the languages and, you know, gets you know, over all the face of the earth. We hear this Christian church, which just scattered all the face of the earth, is now being united in language um, so and being brought in. Pentecost is actually the fulfillment of the, the gospel will go out to all nations, correct? Yeah, because yeah, um, all the nations are there. Because we like to think people say that Jesus can't come back until we reach some remote tribe on some oh, right, random island right. out of the Pacific or something. <clears throat> that's not the when promise, it, yeah. This is, it's actually, that's actually fulfilled in Pentecost. Right. Um, and if you take Paul seriously, which we probably should, mm-hmm. uh, in a couple of his letters, I think it's Romans, he says that the gospel has gone out to all the world. And he's serious. He's not saying, oh, we have maybe some people. He says that this has been done. The mission's accomplished, right? So even before the end of the New Testament era, we have where the apostles, it's been done. They have accomplished the task. And then you get to the point, well, why is God waiting? Well, he's waiting for us, yeah. right? Uh, so we're not waiting for some remote tribe that, We don't you know, have to... Jesus isn't waiting for any specific nope. thing to come back. Nope, Something There's doesn't nothing. have to happen for him to come back. He can come back at any time. Yep. It's because what, um, God is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness, but he wants All to be saved. everyone to come to repentance. Yep. So he's giving time. So the fact that this has continued now for 2,000 years is that God is gracious, um, we should not forget that, right? He's wanting us to turn to him. And so he's patient because he doesn't want any of us to be lost, which is good because if he came 100 years ago, I wouldn't be in the picture. Yeah. Um, you know, if he came 10 years ago, my boys wouldn't have been in the picture. Um, so thanks be to God that he has waited um, and he still is gracious. Which so. It did probably go out to all nations because we like to think, you know, we think of like this random tribe in the Americas, but there's actually a lot of recent evidence that the, what the, what we currently think of as the Native American tribes, their ancestors came over possibly as um, recently as 300 AD. Yeah. So they mm-hmm. weren't over in America, right. at, you know, around the time of the early church. So right. people, and, people traveled around a lot more oh, than yeah. we like to think they did. Oh, yeah. So, um, um, and you have Thomas. Thomas, we're told, went to India. Yeah. And so you have, you know, going out to Far East and, you know, China, who knows? People weren't all um, as separated as we sometimes think. They, yeah. they traveled a lot. It wasn't as easy traveling as it is now, but right. they traveled. No, they did. You know, we're, we're enlightenment thinkers, so we think yeah. that we have mastered the world. But, uh, and so we downplay the rest of the people who have ever lived on this earth, um, mm. much to our shame, because I think they're better connected to the world than we yeah. are. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of that snobbery yeah. there that we have it better now than they did. But Anyway, okay, so that's probably enough on that. Where else? Uh, we talked a little bit about the connections to Genesis, um, right. but there's also a connection to Paul's epistles and Acts, obviously. Yeah. Um, all the places that Paul, which maybe is a good time to bring, sponsored by. Right, uh, today's <laughs> video, Between Two Bibles, is sponsored by Paul's Missionary Journeys, uh, brought to you uh, by the Lord Jesus himself. Thanks be to God for that. As you can kind of see, I'll probably zoom in a little bit, get on the camera. Uh, you can see the three different trips that Paul takes. Um, 
he, you know, his, his trips are sponsored, you know, his trips are motivated by God's call, right? That we're told that the church in Antioch is the first sending church in the New Testament, Antioch. And it's for the, they're first called Christians. Um, and they're, Paul's, you know, trained there. And then the Holy Spirit says, set aside for me, Paul and Silas, for the work I have for them. And sends them out and they go take a tour of the churches. You know, it's kind of just a, the first one's kind of more local. It's kind of more of a, a localized trip. And then the second, then they go back after they get done, they go back through and they visit the churches, they strengthen them. We're told they appoint leaders. Talk about being organized because we think that the early church was just, they're doing whatever feels good, right? Whatever just feels right in the moment. And no, they're very organized. They're kind of, you know, Paul's very like, we got to pick out leaders. We got people managing this and we're going to get them connected. You read Paul's, talk about connection of Paul's letters. Paul is name dropping people all the time. And it seems like these Christians know each other. Um, you know, that Paul is sending out scribes, they're receiving people, there's, there's a lot of well, communication. you'll find some of the same names in some of them too, which is, I, yeah. I, I was trying to, I was reading those side by side once, uh, this was a few months ago, I don't think I was bored, <laughs> and I found all the names, and it's, they, you find connections, and it's kind of interesting to see some of them. It is, um, yeah. And then, because, um, so yeah, so in Acts you get, you know, he's at Ephesus, he writes letters to the Ephesians, Corinth, Corinthians, um, right. that's, that's a t- tongue twist. Thessalonica, Thessalonians. Um, I don't know if, uh, if um, Timothy's mentioned. Yep. He writes letters to Timothy later. Um, I think Titus is mentioned too in here somewhere. Yeah. Titus, um, I don't know what I'm all forgetting. Well, there's a letter to the Romans. He ends up in Rome. Right. right? Um, so you can place some of these letters here. You know, we're told um, uh, when Paul leaves Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonica, um, and the people there, this is actually what prompts his letter to them. And so the reason why Paul writes Thirst Thessalonians is that he only spent three weeks with them. And then he got kicked out of town because, you know, wherever Paul goes in the letter here, he gets run out of town pretty much every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he writes that letter to them shortly after that, you know, maybe like a few weeks, a couple months, because he's worried. Like, we only spent three weeks. Imagine, you know, if we had never been Christian. Like, none of us here in Marshfield were Christian. And then some guy comes here, and for three weeks only... Mm-hmm. Teaches us the faith, and all of a sudden he's run out of town, and then we're left here. People don't like us because we're Christians, and uh, we've only been taught for three weeks. And we then don't have a boom. Bible, right? We don't have a Bible. We don't have maybe a, a chain of command or st- really a good structure yet. Um, I mean, if you were Paul, you would be really worried about them. And so First Thessalonians prompts his letter, and then we find out in First Thessalonians he's blown away by God because God kept them faithful. That God's word actually did what God's word promises to do. Imagine that. It just shows um, that we're not the ones responsible for growing the right, church. <laughs> right, that God is the one that's going to grow the church. And it's probably a, I've heard professors say that a better word for this, the title for this book is not the acts of the apostles, but the acts of the spirit, the acts of God. Mm. Um, so this is God's acts still working mm. through the apostles, but he's the one in charge, which, you know, I think maybe we get to it a little bit later, how we are added to the faith. But you see that, right? The 3,000, let's do oh. it. You know, they are added to the faith. They, they didn't add themselves. They didn't make a conscious choice. It was they were they permitted were, to. They were you know, you know, God allowed it. Yeah, uh, God, God added to their numbers daily. I think yeah, I was worded when I'm back in John. I flipped back too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's chapter two there. Yeah, yeah. Where is it? Yeah, the fellowship of the believers and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Yeah. So again, and that language shows up a few times through Acts about. That, yeah, we were added. So we don't choose. It's not something you have to decide. You don't have to say this prayer. It's the Lord adds you. And you're baptized. And the baptism isn't something you do either. It's done to you. Right, it's God's Um, word. You don't baptize yourself. You don't sprinkle yourself with water and say, I baptize myself. It's someone else has to do it to you. Right. Um, Well, I always love that language, right? Because baptism is a death and resurrection, right? It's not symbolic of that because, you know, then you're symbolically forgiven, which... That doesn't work out too well. How can you be symbolically forgiven? Um, but I, you know, I love one of the images. I think it was maybe Wolf Mueller who said this. But you know, trying to imagine, you know, baptism is you being crucified. And he's like, imagine that you think that this is you doing that. So you know, you're, you're trying to mount yourself on the cross, and you got to take the yeah, nail. Yeah, you yeah. got to hammer yourself in. Like the image is ridiculous. Um, you have to be crucified. You can't crucify yourself. Uh, you can't raise it once you're I dead. You can't raise say yourself. A dead body can't. I mean, Lazarus had to wait in the tomb until Jesus says, "Lazarus, come out." Yep. Um, so baptism is God's work, right? That's that, that's the key difference between a lot of your American Protestantism and spirituality and the ancient historic Christian faith is that this is God's work, not not my work.
not my show for God, not my discipleship thing. Um, it is God's work that he's doing to me. Thanks be to God. So, and that's really obvious in Acts if you really, you know, if you start paying attention to who's doing the verbs, I think is right. really how you say it. Um, and it's you, when you're talking about people coming to the faith, it's, it's done to them yep. kind of um, thing. So Exactly. Not people deciding it's, they heard the word and bam, they have faith. Right. And and that, that's implied even in the word conversion, right? That you have to be changed. Like God changes us. He changes our will, our disposition breaks our hearts, and turns us, right? So I'm the one that's being turned. I'm the one believing, but it's God who's implanted that faith, who's given it to me, uh, and things like that. So I'm, uh, I'm not the creator of my faith. I'm not even the sustainer of my faith, but God continues to supply and to give. It's his doing. Um, and then when it doesn't happen, like we'll see sometimes in the book of Acts, right? It's their fault, right? They resisted. Um, that's a fun, this is a different theological conversation we could have right now, mm. but we we'll probably should stick with the text because we could talk about that for an yes, hour by itself. Yes, there's a lot in here you uh, can talk about. The Did why you say some, you were doing others. Acts for Bible study next year? Maybe? I think so, yep. So if you're really interested in Acts, come to our Wednesday Bible study. Wednesday morning Bible class. It's It'll most start... likely going to be on Acts. Yep, <laughs> most likely going to be Acts, probably. I have actually all the resources there for it. Okay, it's going to be on uh, Acts. It's going to be on Acts. <laughs> And uh, it will start it after Labor Day. So Wednesday after Labor Day. Wednesdays after Labor Day. So come on out if you're interested. Uh, we'll have some good, good times and good discussions. So, side, but... Uh, Shameless promotions. So, yeah. yeah. Oof. Hey, we have a right. That's right. Um, hey, sorry. Okay, so we talked about connected, you know, so you'll see a lot of connections to the epistles. I know one I noticed because... Um, been listening to the word of the Lord endures forever. Mm. Pastor Will Reed, Whedon does a 15 minute. Um, so that's another plug, not for our church, but um, if you look up the word of the Lord endures forever, Pastor Will Whedon, he does a 15 minute podcast daily. He goes basically through a few verses at a time. Um, right now he's in first Corinthians. Um, anyway, so first Corinthians is on my mind right now. Um, and he, in there, Paul talks about how when he was in Corinth that he, you know, wasn't a burden to the people. He didn't ask for any money. And it says in Acts that that's when he was, um, he worked with Priscilla and Aquila as a tent maker. Yeah. Apparently Paul was a tent maker. Yeah. So he supported himself. And then on, um, on the Sabbath, he went and reasoned. And um, so they didn't have to support him. And so that's mentioned in his letter to the Corinthians. Yeah. And that, uh, let's see, where is it? Leave Rome because he's in Corinth. Um, it's another thing. It's really hard to get acts in order. That's true. Yeah, because there is a lot going on. There's in a acts. lot going on and a lot of back and forth. And so, if you can't remember when where things are in acts, you're not alone. Right. Because we all do that. So good. But yeah. Anyway, connection Corinthians. Good stuff. So you'll see a few of those, and you'll catch those more later as we get into the uh, um, epistles, which won't be for a bit yet. But um, do, 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 do. we talked about how to come to the faith. Jewish law, that's Ooh. kind of talked about a bit, especially with the um, Jerusalem Council. Um, and what do, the question comes up when the Gentiles get, are brought into the church. So do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? Do they right. have to follow Jewish law? Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, important discussion, especially since we will start getting into some of the law when we get into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And you'll see stuff and it's like, well, we follow some of that, but not the other part of it, there's weird stuff like dietary stuff that we right. don't follow. Why don't we follow it? And people people use that a lot of times, like when the homosexuality debate comes up, people are like, right. well, like, you're against homosexuality, Jerry but can... why aren't you, you know, against eating this or eating, sh you eat shrimp. You just like the laws when it's to... convenient. Yeah. Yep. So, but Acts has a very good explanation for why we don't. Right. Um, and that's just the who the Gentiles are, right? They're not Jews. They're not part of that commonwealth. They're not a part of those laws and things like that. Um, and so, you know, you get to the, the book of Acts, and this is a big problem in Paul's letters. Uh, the book of Galatia, uh, Galatians was written for this purpose. Paul touches on this the in Romans Judaizers and Corinthians. were coming in yep. and causing problems. And they would say, your faith in Jesus doesn't count because you first need to become circumcised. And after circumcised, you follow some of these, these dietary laws. And then, then, then you can be a Christian and follow Jesus and say you're part of the kingdom of God. Okay. And Paul will vehemently fight against that. Um, even to the point in the you know book of Galatians that Paul will even say the law of God in its entirety, right? And then you get to what does that mean exactly? And there's different theories about what that means. Uh, Luther he even will come to the point of saying we don't even follow we don't follow the Ten Commandments because Moses gave them. Um, we will follow them because this is just how God made the world uh, and, and, and Jesus reemphasizes them. Right, right. 
uh, that this is God's structure for society. Why some laws and not others? Uh, because when you're reading the book of Exodus, you're reading Leviticus when God is establishing all this, and when it's repeated again in Deuteronomy, um, who's he talking to? He's talking to the nation of Israel. And God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. You are my people. I am your God. I rescued you from Egypt. Here's how you live now. Uh, and so God kind of prescribed these things. And you're like, why? You know, because you get some really weird. Why can't you cook a goat in its mother's milk? You know, and things like that. Why? Why do you have to follow some of these various restrictions and no pigs? You know, uh, why can't you have the garments and things like that? Um, and this was to denote them as a weird people. So when you supposed came, to separate them from yeah, the nations around them because everyone else did these things, but God's like, you are not going well, to do some these of things. them had to do with idol worship, right? And, paganism and such too so if they did them um, i think that's where some of the like cutting your hair a certain way and yep. stuff and tattoos and because life you know we think of the world now as secular right we can have a life that's not religious which is not that's really completely foreign anyway right. that, that's <laughs> completely, not true now right but yeah it's, it's foreign completely to foreign to scriptures and and foreign to life and yeah like you said it's not really true people think you can right i can be over here and have life on my own but that's religious a lot of what we call secular is actually very pagan yeah, it is it is um so yeah, yeah so everything that you did in life had a religious significance to it uh, whether it's eating um whether it's you know even how you bathe you know there's a do certain things when you bathe and clean and, and whatnot uh how you dress denoted even religious overtones and whatnot um, so, because the gods, you know, and the pagan, even the ancient pagan worldview is that the gods are involved with everything in life, and therefore you have to do certain things. Uh, so God is a part of every aspect of life, and that's true even in, you know, the one true God, uh, that he is intimately involved with his creation. And so therefore, when you do things like, you know, what, what probably when you, for example, the cooking a goat in its mother's milk, is that it's probably an omen, kind of like, you know, a zodiac mm. kind of thing. And so you, you take the poor baby goat, you kill it, and then you cook it, and it's, you know, and you're trying to get signs and, and things you like that. You read the entrails kind of thing. Right. Uh, so that's most like, we're not told exactly what that is, but probably what the people in the land of Cana were doing. Um, so stuff like that. So it really is to denote them as a, a people set apart by God. Um, and this comes to an end when the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah collapse. And so it's even over. like some of the punishments for breaking law, we don't stone people for stuff. That's because... That was, God was king over Israel, and so yep. these were the, he had what set up the laws and the punishments, yep. whereas we're not in a theocracy, we're not Israel. All right, these, so this passes, <laughs> these things pass away. But the things that don't pass away is how God has built the universe, right? God's order. Um, you know, some will call it natural law. When we mean by natural, we're not talking about like nature. Uh, we're talking about how God has set, set up. up things. Um, so I think a lot of people will, we, we can get into this more when we get into like Leviticus and stuff, but you get like the moral law, civil law, right. and um, priestly laws. Right, Ceremonial. So moral law is what kind of stuck. It's the natural law. Yeah. Um, it's how God wants us to live. Right. It's the law written on our hearts kind of thing. Yeah. And this is kind of how God, you know, the Ten Commandments are an expression of God's natural law. It's, mm -hmm. it's. And when we talk about 10, right, we, we'll get that when we get to Exodus because there's different ways to number the 10. Like what does 12. the word 10 mean? <laughs> um, you know, and, and all that good stuff. And we'll get there when we get yeah. there. But um, so there's all that and that all that discussion. But here in the book of Acts, you catch that where... It becomes a big thing. In... Yep. And so the council decides, right, the very first church council, right, some people will, you know, if you know your church history at all, uh, the you know, some will mark the very first church council to be in 325, Council of Nicaea. However, there have been, there were dozens of local and regional councils for hundreds of years before that too. I mean, they, they I think they the had a council. The churches gather together. And... They always did. Uh, I think there's a council in uh, 180 AD that is talked about infant baptism. Um, well, in some ways, like even like our triannual synod convention is sort of like a church council. Right. All the churches in our synod get together and still do decide it. on stuff, debate stuff. and Yeah. It's just the church gets together. And but they talk the about it. this is the first big one that yep. the churches and, all got together. This and is the first everyone's big there. issue. Yep. Um, and, so what to do with these Gentiles? Yeah, um, they believe. What do we do with them? Do they have to become circumcised? Do they have to become like a Jew? And when you look at the um, argument there, uh, what's Peter's main argument for, um, let's see here. Um, verse 10, I love that. 15 verse 10. 
Uh, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Right. Basically, they weren't able to keep the law, so why are you making them keep the law? Exactly, right? You get to the, Paul, all those who rely on the law are under a curse because you can't. Um, That's the whole point, really, of the giving of the law is to show that we can't keep the law. Right. It's kind of. Yeah. Uh, you know, the law is given, you know, get this in Romans 3. Why does God give the law? To put everything... You know, so we all would be quiet um, and be held accountable to God. So when God's law comes to us, it makes me realize I have sinned. I have transgressed. I have, you know, forsaken. Um, you get this with Paul in 1 Timothy, right? The law is given not to good people, but the bad people. So the fact that we need the law means that we're not good. Uh, because if we were good, we wouldn't be, we would just do, do it. it. We would just do it. Um, Usually laws come about because someone did something not good. Right. <laughs> so the more red tape and the more laws. So when people say we need to come out of the law for this, it's just going to make things worse because mm -hmm. one, our sinful flesh is always working against us. Uh, and two, it's under us. It's over, you know, it's overestimating our ability. Um, Having another is law not, isn't going to make people no, follow it. Nope. It will never work that way. Uh, when the law increases, so too does the trespass. So God gave the 10 commandments to make sin increase. Uh, not that the law gives sin, because the law is good. It's God's holy and righteous will. It's, we're rebellious. We're, and we're as soon strong. as you're, it's like a five-year-old boy saying, telling him, don't touch that. And what know. does he immediately do? Go and touches. Touches it. Yep. The law <laughs> you know that, right? Trust, yeah, not some, maybe. <laughs> they have yeah. seen that a few times. Yeah. As soon as you're told not to do something, that's exactly what you want to do. <laughs> right. It is, right? And that still happens with a lot of people today, right? Yeah. They tell them one thing, they'll, they'll do it anyway. Um yeah, so you get that year of the law, how God works, and, and all that good stuff, too. So the law is important. We, you know, we'll have more of those discussions. So we'll, there's even more to talk about, more points to make out with that. Um, but probably a good point to pause on that because yeah. you know, we'll, we'll steal our thunder for yes. uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Galatians, and Corinthians. You know, and well, do you want to briefly talk about what they actually said? They, the What is it? The, well, I can't find the letter now. Um, there was the strangled thing from food sacrifice to idols. That's obvious. Um, right. Paul talks about that later in um, in Corinthians. It um, seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, so idolatry, mm -hmm. um, and from blood and from what has been strangled, all acts of things that you do in pagan, you know, kind of uh, um, sacrifices, and from sexual immorality, right? Because this is a, a poor witness um, and, and things it like that as well. breaks apart the family, which right. isn't good. And, all, and ultimately, sexual immorality in the Old Testament, too, is always equated with idolatry. Um, idolatry always happens in sexual immorality and, and vice versa. You know, they almost kind of play hand in hand. You know, the law all fits together. Um, you break one, you break the whole thing. Okay. So, yeah. So, I've, so that kind of cover. obviously, we'll talk more about Jewish law, but it seemed important to talk about since in Acts, it comes right. up with the Gentiles and, well, this is why we don't follow some of the law. I mean, the first, the early Christians kind of came to that yeah. conclusion too, that it's not necessary yeah. for us to And then in 586 and... BC when the temple was destroyed. And even when the Old Testament, the people come back, it hasn't been reestablished. Yeah. Um, that came to an end. It's kind of like, uh, and that's how Nehemiah, you read the book of Nehemiah, which we'll get there too, mm -hmm. uh, but it reads that way, that God has kept his promise by bringing us back, but it's kind of like the old covenant's been broken. That's what he said, we broke the covenant God, what's next? And that's where they—that's kind of where the Old Testament closes. Is that the Old Covenant's been broken? Uh, it's left in shambles. Uh, God has made promises about a new covenant, and uh, you know all the, pr the promise made to Abraham, the promise made to David, the promise made to Adam and Eve. And you're kind of like, okay, well, how is this going to come together? And then New Testament opens up. Um, so basically, Israel, as we read about in the Old Testament, doesn't really exist past no. the destruction of the temple and the exile. Right. We like we always—it's like the Jews. The Jews and Jesus, they weren't Israel anymore. Right, yeah, the, yeah. The Israel that exists in the contemporary Israel isn't Israel. No. Nope. Um, it has the same name, some of the descendants probably, but it's not Israel. Nope, not it as it is in the Old Testament. Right. That Which, God originally made the covenant with. Yep. So that's done. And so who is the Israel today? We would say the church. The church is Israel, and Israel is the church. Um, they go hand in hand. So the Old Testament believers are part of the church. We, as we are, and we are a part of Israel. So you and I, we're Gentiles, uh, you know, non-Jews, mm -hmm. but yet we are been grafted, as Paul would say, we've been grafted into Israel, which happens in the book of Acts all the time, right? The Jews become jealous, 
And then the Gentiles are just overjoyed. Why? Because they're now a part of Israel. Um, and this kind of, you know. What, God's people. Right. What makes you a child of Abraham? Faith. You know, uh, faith in the promise um, as we have been now granted. Okay. So one final topic for today, which I think will cover the last little bits of stuff we didn't cover, is um, the stuff that happens in Acts and how it's evidence that Christianity is true. Okay. Um, so. Let's hear it. Um, well, there's what was the minimal facts approach, um, the stuff that people generally believe is true. Um, one of those is that Jesus was crucified. There's a lot of evidence that Jesus was crucified. Um, there's a lot of evidence that the tomb was empty. Um, but then some of the other ones come up in here, the, um, that one of them is actually Saul's conversion. Mm. Um, Saul, which later to be, you know, he's known as Paul, which we always like to think he was Saul. And then when he converted, he became Paul. And that's not Saul is what his Jewish name and Paul is his Greek name. Right. Um, and so when he goes out to the Gentiles, he becomes he's Paul. And when he's with the Jews, he's Saul. And um, anyway, so that's one of the, that event, which is a pivotal event in Acts too. Saul, you know, he was persecuting the church and then all of a sudden he has his, the, um, the road to, the road to Damascus. Damascus. I was going to say Emmaus and that's the other one. Um, <laughs> the road to Damascus experience where Lots he actually experiences Jesus um, and all of a sudden becomes the greatest advocate for the church. Um, that's one right. of the main evidences that Christianity is actually true. I mean, this guy who, he was persecuting the church. I mean, he was he, he says he was, you know, the Pharisee, you know, he was basically big in the Jew, you know, he was a Roman citizen, that was a big deal. I mean, he had a lot going for him, and all of a sudden, Poor six, six. he throws all this away to basically spread the same news he was trying to Kill. suppress. Um, and so something, something had to have happened to him right. to, and you know, people don't just all of a sudden change. change. He could have had a hallucination, I suppose, but this right. is a big thing, because it combined with, other stuff like the disciples, I mean, all the disciples but John um, were martyred, and we get a little bit of that. I mean, Stephen gets martyred, and he wasn't a disciple, but, you know, he was with the disciples, and um, James, the brother of John, gets killed in, um, in Acts, and there's this, people don't die for what they know is false. They wouldn't right. be willing to be tortured. All they'd have to do is say, nope, we made the whole thing up. Um, I mean, obviously, people will die for something that they believe to be true, but they won't die for something they know to be false. And right. the disciples were all in a position to know whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. Um, and the very fact that um, the church, they were willing to die for it is strong evidence um, that you know Christianity is true. Jesus actually yeah. rose from the dead. Um, and then the other thing was, I think this comes in, I forget which chapter it is, but where the, um, is it the Pharisees or the, priests or whatever we're talking about how leave you know if you leave them be they'll right where, i don't know where chapter that yeah so that's chapter lost. five chapter five thank you like i said i can never remember where things are in here um it's uh verses 33 and following 33 do, 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 um they're enraged and wanted to kill i think is is it peter yeah, the, uh, the 12 there. Yeah, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamiel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, the Thetis yeah, yeah. uh, rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him came this other guy. He too perished. Um, they scattered. were scattered. And they were like, just leave them alone because, you know, Jesus, their leader... Is killed. Has been yeah. killed. So they're going to scatter. Which is interesting because, um, well, you've got the, chapter. the martyrdom of Stephen, which Saul, Paul, was the one overseeing that. And right. the church is scattered. Yeah. But what happens when the church is scattered, in this spread case... Spread the word. The word is... The church actually grows. That's the interesting thing about Christianity is it grows best under persecution. Yeah. Like, you see it growing, like, right now in China... Africa, yeah. the Middle East, you know, you see it growing in all these places where there's persecution. Um, even like in Canada, there's a couple of pastors who have been arrested with COVID orders yeah. and they say their churches have actually grown, grown in numbers. They're underground and they've grown in numbers. This is cool. Um, and so anyway, there's a lot of evidence and acts that the, you know, Christianity is true. I mean, Luke was a very good historian. I mean, there's weird details in here that he could only have known if he lived at that time. Um, cause there's stuff that Luke says in acts that 
um, historians were like, well, that's all made up. And then all of a sudden they come across some seal or some writing that they're like, it says the exact same thing. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, Luke was right. And so Luke was, you know, he's a good historian. And so he's, you know, anyway. Right. So oh, you're right. It's good evidence that Christianity is actually true, or it's very grounded actually in evidence. Um, it is. And we don't have a blind faith. Yeah. And I think that shows up really well in Acts. It does. Um, so. I love right. that, the scatter point. Um, the same word that the Pharisees, the Gamma, which is Paul's teacher, by the way, because mm. um, he will say that in his letters that he was taught by Gamma Meal, and uh. here he is. Um, and so those who were scattered, right, eight for eight, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And so they use that same word scatter here to kind of draw like, oh yeah, they said that once this was scattered, this was going to come to nothing. And when they're scattered, well, they start making more churches. Um, so I love that point. It's, you know, that's, that's really cool. You know, so Paul really before, even before he's converted happens to be the greatest evangelist effort ever because he starts persecuting the church and it causes it to spread even more. So uh, and that's, I think it's Bonnie who says, it must be so frustrating for those who hate God, hate the church, hate Jesus, uh, that when they try to stamp on it, it just spreads like wildfire. Um, They'd that, be better off doing nothing to the church right, in some ways. Which is why apathy is always the greatest enemy of the church. Yes. Um, Don't be apathetic. All right. So good. Yeah. Any other things that you can think of in the text that you see? I took a few notes here, but. I, those are what I kind of thought. I think we've covered quite a bit actually through here. Well, there's, there's so much. Like I said, we could probably spend three hours yes. on this, just on this section alone. Um, but some of the things that I, I kind of caught in our reading of it, as you were talking here too, that it caught me, uh, the time in Acts. You know, this picks up in 35 AD, you know, 30, you know, right after Jesus crucified, so really 33 AD. The ascension. Um, yeah, the 40 ascension. Days after, yeah, 40 days after Jesus yeah. rose. This book then ends in about mid-60s. So, you know, the time frame in the book of Acts that we read is 30 years worth of church history here. It's, uh, and this is the only document that we have of the early church. It's the only thing that mm -hmm. survived. Um, thankfully, and it's such a, so it's a treasure to see this. But a lot of time happens. So that's an important thing, too. It's not like this is just a couple years worth of time. This is 30 years worth of time. Um, I love in chapter 16, the Macedonian call. Right? This is the, the moment that Christianity came into Europe uh, and then has come now to us. This is almost like a, Paul is trying to go east here. And he keeps getting blocked by, we're told the spirit of Jesus doesn't let him go. And then he gets a call from a, a vision from Macedo, a Macedonian right. man. He says, come here, give us the word. Uh, and so he goes there. Europe. Greek, yep. Um, um, it probably is there. It'd be just north of Greece. Um, if Greece is on there, it'd be kind of right in here. There's Greece, yeah, right there. Um, right there. <laughs> yeah. So he kind of comes over there. And this is, you know, the first converts in Europe. And, you know, from there, we get... The history Spreads of the church. So Europe. that moment is a moment that became Europe. And God forced it that way, which is kind of cool to stop and think about. God chose. Um, another thing, too, is how uh, Luke writes. And I, I caught that. I remembered it when you said about Saul and Paul. Luke is, talk about brilliant historian. He's a brilliant writer, too. Um, you know, he's a doctor. And we find out in the book of Colossians that Luke is a doctor. Um, apparently a painter, too. He, early church said he's a painter. Um, so he's an artist. Uh, so he's a well-cultured man, and he's also a good writer. Um, when he's in, when the book of Acts, when the events are taking place in Jerusalem and Palestine and areas like that, Paul, Luke uses Hebrewism, so Hebrew words and Hebrew terms and even Hebrew structures. When all of a sudden they're in Gentile country, he switches, and he uses Gentile terms and Gentile customs and Gentile words. Um, so it's brilliant, uh, just how he covers it. Um, some people have said... Um, the shipwreck in chapter 27 is perhaps the most nautical written tale that's ever been written about a really? shipwreck. Yeah. Um, just the terms that he uses, and it's like Luke is able to flip on a he dime. He's a very smart man. Very smart man. So <clears throat> Which talk that's about, another thing that dumb. Yeah. people always think that, well, I mean, like the disciples too, they're like, well, these were these dumb fishermen and, you know, backwaters and all that. And that's not necessarily true. Like James and John were probably might have been rich because their father was able to hire extra hands. Right. So, yeah, <clears throat> these people aren't all these uneducated, poor people. Um, it's some of these people, I mean, like, because Paul was a Roman citizen. I mean, you yeah. don't just, not everyone was, a, it's like 10% of the population in Rome was a Roman citizen. Right. 
Um, because, yeah, you had to, I don't know what all the requirements were. I can't remember off the, the top of my head. The emperor could grant it to you. Yeah, or you had to have uh, land. Born, you know, or you served in the Roman military, yeah. I think, for 20 years. So, like, women slaves, people who didn't have land, yep. none of them were considered Roman citizens. So. Right, so this is a you know, rare thing, yeah. which he uses to his advantage at certain points when they condemn him publicly, but then want to release him secretly. He's like, no, 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 you drag me in here publicly, you're going to drag me out of here publicly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So yeah, these people aren't stupid. Right, uh, and I and I love that. and bringing that up too, um, it, that whole point of that the Pharisees at the beginning, right? They they see Peter and John and they're all preaching, and they note that these men had been with Jesus and were common men, um, and then later on in chapter ten, the same word is used with Peter when he says, "I now know from God that I'm to call no one common." Uh, so here, the, this kind of route, the Pharisees, they look at them and despise them. They're common men. Um, and here, Peter, he learns the lesson not to call anyone common. common. Um, do not call, you know, call unclean what I have made clean. Do not call common. And Peter uses that same exact word. Do not call common. I will not call you common. Uh, so that kind of hit me too when I was reading through it this time around. You know, something you don't see. Um, other things too, how they preach in the book of Acts. There's a lot uh, of that. There is. 25% of the book of Acts is actually speeches um, and sermons. And, and, one of the, and how they preach it is that usually they tell the Old Testament story. So if you want to know what the Old Testament's about and how we should read the Old Testament, Stephen's going to tell you. Peter's going to tell you. Paul's going to tell you um, that it's a story where God made promises. His people royally messed up and resisted God. Uh, God came through in his punishments anyway. The people, are, you know, and here they are now resisting yet again. Um, and you know this message is what brings people to faith, or will push them away. They will not want anything to do with it, right? So They'll harden their hearts, make yeah. their ears deaf. And Peter says the same sermon twice to the crowds in Acts two, brings three thousand people in, and then he says it to the leaders and the Pharisees, and they gnash their teeth at him and they want him dead. Um, and so you get that uh, the same message, but it's either accepted or rejected. You know, they're they're added or they're not. Um, Another thing about <clears throat> church growth, it's really. We're just supposed to say the message, right. and there's no it's not silver really bullet up to us. <laughs> right, if we could just get the right program, we'll bring so many people in. That's not how it works. No, um, and we're just that's supposed our to say the message, thinking. and God either brings people in or yep. they don't. Yep. So that makes us that we should drive ourselves to prayer because if it's all really in God's hands, then we need to be praying to Him about that. Um, become better prayers. Um, yeah. So there's that point too. That's really important to key in. How do they preach the message? That's good. Um, and another thing, too, let me see. Um, people in the book of Acts begin to look like Jesus, right? Their lives start to pattern themselves after that. So you're going to see this in Paul. Um, he's going to be arrested in Jerusalem, you know, accused of the same thing Jesus was about the temple. Um, and he's brought to trial uh, before the world, just kind of like Jesus is. Peter, same thing happens to him where um, he's arrested the same time that James is killed um, Peter's arrested, and then we're told that Herod is waiting until Passover to bring him out, just like he did Jesus, you know, and kind of condemn him. What are we going to do with him? You know, crucify him would have, you know, maybe a similar answer. Uh, so the life of Jesus' disciples will start looking a lot like Jesus' life. Um, and, and Acts will pick that up, especially in the back of the last few chapters with Paul. Paul's life starts looking a lot like Jesus' life. Um, the Christian life the is words. not easy. Right. There's a lot of suffering. And it's designed that way almost. Yeah, that's how Christians are made, to suffer. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I will show Paul how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's quite a word. Yeah, and I love um, talk about looking like Jesus. Um, Stephen, right, his words before he dies, uh, he looks up, same thing Jesus. Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin, which Forgive he them. is. Yeah, he forgives them. And he even tells, Jesus says, right, from now on you will see the Son of Man standing in the clouds in heaven, you know, and all this position of power and authority. Well, we're told that Stephen sees this right before his stone. He sees Jesus at the right hand of God and the powers, and he says it, and that's what makes them mad too. How does um, Luke know that Stephen saw that? Apparently someone, maybe <laughs> Paul, I don't know. We're told maybe it's in, directly inspired by the Holy Spirit too. I suppose it seems like there's a lot that maybe Jesus directly told Paul. Right. Because he kind of references that later almost. Right. I just had that thought. I'm no, like, it's oh, a good thought. Yeah. How... So some of this might be directly inspired, right? Yeah. The Holy Spirit inspired the text. That could be true too. Paul was there, so Paul could have maybe said, "Yeah, Stephen said this." Um, uh, so, you know, we're told Paul yeah, gets he visions. He says it, doesn't he? Yeah, and then the last thing he says is that you know, do not hold this sin against them, just like Jesus. You know, 
Father, forgive them, but they know not what they do. So Stephen says the same things that Jesus says. And then he says um, the last thing, um, you know, receive my spirit, which Jesus said. So the, the actions, the words, the life of these people, these Christians, our lives too, um, will start looking a lot like Jesus' life, which is kind of cool when you think mm-hmm. about it. Just as we share in his sufferings, Paul, right? So too will we share in his you know, comfort and the glory too. So good. Kind of um, goes against prosperity preachers too. Right. Yeah. You don't become a Christian to. Now. Yeah, you're not going to. Yeah, that's what Joel Osteen yeah. always says that. Right. Um, no, Moore, you're not going yeah. to have a Lamborghini or a big house or a, because you became a Christian. It's and not going to happen. Notice what that does to Jesus. Jesus is your ticket. To it's like great a things. vending machine. Yeah. So Jesus <laughs> isn't the goal. Jesus is but a means to what you really want in life. Yeah. Right. That's that's evil. Yeah. Um, it knows that I once heard a missionary in Africa. There was kids, and they just watched whatever Christian stuff they can get on the radio waves and TV waves and whatnot. And uh, they picked up a, a preacher who was saying that if you just have enough faith, your life is going to look good. You're going to, you know, live in luxury and things like that. And this poor child, living in you know middle of mm-hmm. Africa, is living in a war torn country. You know, it, I think so his, his his parents were either killed or something like that. So you're thinking, I don't have. I don't have faith. faith. And that and that little kid looked up at the missionary and said. Does God not love us, or do I not have enough faith that I don't have what that preacher is telling me? And it's just, oh, you, you say that, and it's like, it shame shows, on America. It shows the danger <clears throat> of calling stuff Christian that isn't yep. really Christian. You have to be, just because something has the label of Christian doesn't make it Christian, it doesn't make it good, it doesn't make it edifying, yep. it doesn't make it true. Yep. Um, so exactly. be careful with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. If Just because, you know, those big, usually when you have these really big famous preachers you want to be very careful about that because usually that's Being not famous some, is never good that's usually not something that pastors actually really seek out um and yep. they should seek out and it's probably not something god's going to grant because it usually comes with a lot of pitfalls <laughs> yep. and i can't imagine trying to be a famous because you can't take care of the people that you already no. have um yeah you're not really a pastor at that point you're, you're just a celebrity a famous speaker yeah so Pastor. With a big ego. <laughs> Pastor implies you're leading the flock. And All right. So. It's always fun. Well, anyway. Well, did you anything, see anything topic. else that you see? Oh, that's good. <laughs> it it dived, dives right into here. So, um, yeah. So, Acts is an interesting book. I mean, obviously, we did not go chapter by no. chapter through this one because there's... So much. It's more the- thematic than... Um, you, yeah, you can't really... Anyway, yeah. So. Damn. It's a good book. It is. Interesting and, history. And in it, we see how God has worked through the church, that he so works with sinful people. Right? There's even disagreement. Paul and, uh, was it Paul and Silas? Paul and Barnabas? Paul and Silas, or one of the two, they disagree. We're told sharply. They yell yeah. at each other. They get angry at each other. Isn't that when Mark, Mark apparently, they disagreed yep. over Mark, which is the Mark who probably wrote the gospel, isn't yeah. it? And we, get, um, we are told the end of Paul's life, what does he say? I think it's Second Timothy, bring Mark to me. He is yeah. useful to my ministry. And so they do reconcile later on. But here in Acts, this disagreement that Paul and Silas have uh, brings you know, Barnabas and Mark, uh, Mark into it too. Um, and, uh, and that's between, I think it may be between Barnabas and, and Saul. Yeah, it's Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas takes... Um, I just closed it. <laughs> Barnabas takes Mark with him and Paul takes Silas with him. Is that how it goes? Yeah. And, and so these, this sharp... Dis- so it tells the truth, right? It doesn't hide the fact that there was disagreements and that... There was a lot of controversy and that there was a lot of problems. And, but it just says that through it all, God did his thing. Um, and that he still does it here at Christ Lutheran, in Marshfield, so in our churches. So even when we have disagreements and problems here, it just, we just have to keep going into yeah. the Word. And, and in the book of Acts, it meant that there was now two pairs of missionaries instead yeah. of one pair. So. so good stuff can come out of disagreement yeah. too. But yeah, we should always be driven to the Word and right. use that as our... I guess the way we argue, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. God God does his thing. Thanks be to God for it. Even sometimes despite ourselves, which yep. is even better. Because um, that means it's his doing. It's not our responsibility, which is actually a great comfort. <laughs> it is. It is. The gospel's good we're just, news. We're called to be faithful, not to do anything else, really. Amen. Amen. God grant it. Well, good. 
Well, that was probably long enough. I don't know how long this was. That was fun, though. <laughs> I think this one was over an hour. It probably was, but hey, we get into some good discussions and good topics, and it's just more fun to kind of bounce it up back, too, because there's things like, as you were talking, like, oh, I need to say that, and, you know, I need to cover that. And, so next um, week we're going to finish off Acts, which yep. is largely Paul going to Jerusalem, um, and then we're actually going to start Exodus. So we'll have a lot to talk about next week, too, and since it's, Exodus starts in the middle of the week, we probably should do what we did last week and cut out... So we'll probably Sounds talk good. about the finish, the finish up acts and start Exodus. So Sounds Exodus good. is interesting too. It is. There's a lot there. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's conclude. We'll give you a, we'll, let's say a final prayer and then we'll do a blessing. Let us pray as we think about, ponder, and meditate upon God's word and the story and salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Your Father in heaven, we give thanks uh, for your word, the word that has brought us to faith in your Son, Continue to let this preaching and teaching impact our hearts and our minds and our ears that we may always hear and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. Lord, as you continue to grant growth and strength, your church may be through your word. May it be not through lies or deceit or personalities or egos, but only through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may hold on to him who is precious, who loves us and gives us of his spirit a down payment of our salvation upon which we would look forward to that last and final day in which you will bring healing and restoration to the kingdom that you have promised to give to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God's peace, Christ Lutheran. Amen.